Now, the Islamic tradition is rooted in knowledge. This rooting is most evident in the first testimony of faith. The statement, no God but God. This statement is known as the Declaration of Tawheed, or the assertion of the unity of God. However, even those familiar with Islamic teachings sometimes forget that this first principle of Islam has nothing to do with history, because it is simply a statement of the way things are. The more sophisticated of Muslim thinkers have always maintained that Tawheed, the Declaration of Unity, is a universal an atemporal truth. To be human is to have an intuition of this truth, and every one of the 124,000 prophets that God has sent from Adam down to Muhammad came with this truth as the core of his message. Tawheed expresses the nature of reality, irrespective of the existence of the universe man or any other beings. However, since we do have a world and human beings, the Islamic tradition takes into account a second fact, that of the human situation. It encapsulates this situation in the words forgetfulness, nisyan, and heedlessness, rafa. Although people do have an innate intuition of Tawheed, they do not necessarily have it ready to mind. They may not find it easy to bring it from latency to actuality or to voice it in language and put it into practice. They need the help of the prophets. With prophecy, the second principle of Islamic faith, the perspective shifts from the atemporal to the temporal, from the eternal to the contingent, and from God to history. Now the first function of the prophets is to remind people of their own divinely given reality. In speaking of this reminder, the Quran employs the word dhikr and several of its derivatives, dhikra, tazkir, tazkir. Moreover, it calls the human response to this reminder by the same word, vicar. The reminder that comes from the side of God by means of the prophets calls forth remembrance from the side of man. The use of the one word for a movement with two directions, from the divine to the human and from the human to the divine, is typical of the Quran's unitary perspective. Here there is in fact only one motivating force, which is the revelation of the good, the true, and the beautiful. But it becomes manifest in two complementary activities. Moreover, the Quran makes it eminently clear that remembrance, the human response to reminder, does not mean simply acknowledging the truth of Tawheed. The word itself also means mention. On the human side, a vicar is both the awareness of God and the expression of this awareness through speech, whether this be vocal or silent. If reminder is the first function of the prophets, their second function is to provide the instructions that allow for living a life that is pleasing to God. The Quran calls these instructions guidance, huda. To follow the guidance of the prophets, is to remember God in thought, word, and deed. So, a vicar is to keep God in view at all times, in all places, and in all activities. Ibn Arabi defines it as al-hudur ma'al madkur, presence with the one remembered. If we remain absent from God in thought, word, or deed, we have not remembered him as he should be remembered. The Quran and the tradition sum up the practical implications of remembrance with the word ibadah, 
which means worship, service, being a servant. This is the most important human task. In the Quran, God says, I created jinn and mankind only to, to worship me, only to serve me. In other words, God created human beings so that they would remember him and bring themselves into conformity with his reality. They can do so only by means of right understanding, right faith, right speech, and right activity. The criterion for rightness is the degree to which one understands, acts, and exists in the presence of God. Being present with God is precisely the vicarial law, the remembrance of God. Now, Islamic faith, as you know, has three principles, not just two. After divine unity and prophecy comes ma'at, the return to God. The return is commonly discussed in terms of death and resurrection. Since everyone must die, and be brought forth in the presence of God. The afterlife is often called the compulsory return. But the more sophisticated theologians, philosophers, and spiritual teachers place much greater stress on the voluntary return. That is, the fact that our existential situation demands that we choose freely to return to God here and now. This existential situation is defined by reality itself, which is primarily God, and secondarily the world and the human self as they actually are, which is to say, as they disclose the reality of God. For those who have eyes to see, the cosmos and the human configuration, by their very nature and in their very modality of being, point to God. And the fact of the repeated reminders leaves no excuse for not seeing and not remembering. To sum up, the general Islamic understanding of the human situation is that correct knowledge of the world and the human soul demands that we undertake the return to God. One returns to God by remembering him on every level of our being. To remember him is to make the fact of his unity, the fact of his absolute and infinite reality, the axis of our thought, speech, and activity. One does so by worship, which is the appropriate response to the facts of Tawheed and prophecy. Thus the Quran speaks of Tawheed and worship as the two fundamental dim dimensions of every authentic tradition. God says in the Quran, we never sent a messenger before thee without revealing to him there is no God but I, so worship me. The formula, no God but I, is precisely the formula of Tawheed in one of its versions. And worshiping God is the proper response to it. This formula is the vicar, a reminder brought by the, pro by the prophets and the corresponding worship is essentially the same formula, the remembrance and mention of God. Now, a great deal could be said about the various forms that the practice of dhikr has taken, not only among those who are known as Sufis, but also among Muslims of many other stripes and colors. However, what I want to do today is to review basic Islamic teachings about the universe and the self in order to suggest not only why a vicar is an efficacious contemplative practice, but also why, in actual fact, there is nothing else that we can do. On close analysis, we see that vicar is the practice of God himself and along with him that of all creation. Unless we understand this, we will not be able to grasp our human condition or to take advantage of it while we have it. Having failed to do so, this world will indeed be accursed for us. At our inevitable return to God, when we will finally recognize with utter certainty that we can do nothing but remember God, we will taste the fruit of that accursedness. Now, anyone familiar with the Quran knows that it speaks of God by detailing his names and activities. In the process, 
it goes to extraordinary lengths to emphasize that it is God's book, his revelation, his speech, and his words. It maintains that all revelation to all the prophets is nothing but God's speech with the purpose of clarifying the nature of reality and explaining the appropriate response. Moreover, the Quran tells us repeatedly that God creates the world by speaking to it. So, just as the Quran and other scriptures are collections of God's signs or verses, ayat, so also the whole universe is a vast collection of God's signs and verses. In effect, God creates the universe by revealing three books, the universe, the human self, and scripture. In each of them, he reveals his signs and he writes out his words. Once we understand that reality is configured by speech, we will also see that the human task is to learn how to read and to understand what we are reading. Then one can follow the instructions laid out in the text of scripture, the text of the world, and the text of the soul. And one can speak with the appropriate response. The interpretation of the Quran, which is the foundation and fruit of all the Islamic sciences, has always entailed the simultaneous interpretation of the universe and the soul. Every Muslim, by accepting the Quran as God's word, has accepted the responsibility of understanding what this word means. The fruit of this understanding redounds on the soul. Every soul will answer for its own reading, not only of the Quran, but also of the other two books, the universe and the soul. And given the fact that it is the soul that itself that reads and understands, the book of the soul is the all-important determinant of our destiny. This helps explain why. In recounting the events that will take place on the day of resurrection, the Quran tells us that every human being will be addressed by these words. Read your book. Your soul suffices you today as a reckoner against you. The crux of knowledge then is to read and know oneself. The whole trajectory of the voluntary return to God is to learn how to interpret oneself through understanding the wisdom present in both revelation and the cosmos. The return reaches its fruition on the day of resurrection. What we as human beings should want to learn is who we are now and who we will be when we arrive back at the meeting with God. All knowledge should serve the goal of this knowledge. Since Dr. Nasser is here, you'll permit me the, uh, to re read a line from Rumi, which makes this point very nicely. The spirit of all of the sciences is this, only this, that you know who you will be on the day of resurrection. In order to know who one is and who one will be, one must know one's relation with God, who created man in his own image. It is clear that the divine speech creates the world and reveals the scriptures. It is this same speech that appears as a distinguishing feature of man, created in God's image. The same speech reveals the words of reminder, guidance, and prayer, whereby man is able to remember his source and undertake the return journey. The same speech will be written out in the book of the soul on the day of resurrection. The human condition then demands knowing that everything we understand, speak, do, and embody is being written and recorded in our own selves. Now, Ibn Arabi, who is not known for his reticence, 
explicates the divine and cosmic speech in enormous detail and in respect to practically every human possibility. In discussing the implications of God's creation of the universe by speaking to it, he frequently elaborates on the expression, the breath of the all-merciful, which he takes from a prophetic saying. According to the Quran, it is God as the all-merciful who sits upon the throne. The throne is typically understood as the outermost sphere, which embraces the whole universe in its infinite spatial and temporal expanse. God as the king sits upon the throne precisely because the universe is his kingdom. He sits on the throne as the all-merciful because the divine mercy, which is the bestowal of the good, the beautiful, and the true, determines the fundamental nature of the universe. The prophet tells us that the inscription on the throne of God reads, my mercy takes precedence over my wrath. Moreover, the throne of God in the human micros microcosm, as we know from last night, is the heart. It follows that, just as, the just as in the macrocosm, nothing lies beyond the throne but God, so also in the microcosm, nothing lies within the throne but God. When the All-Merciful speaks, he articulates his words in his breath, just as we articulate our words in our breath when we speak. Thus the breath of the All-Merciful is the underlying substance of the universe. It is the page upon which God writes out the grand book of the cosmos. The nature of the divine speech that appears in the breath is suggested already in the derivation of the word kalam, speech. It comes from kalma, a word that means to cut or to wound. As Ibn Arabi explains, this indicates that speech leaves effects and traces in the undifferentiated and unarticulated breath. Each of these traces is then called a word, kalama, that is a wound, or an articulation in undifferentiated existence. The breath itself remains forever untouched and unwounded by the words it pronounces, just as our breath is unaffected by the words we speak. In the eternal now, God speaks one word, and that is his command, be. This word gives rise to the beginningless and endless succession of words and worlds that unfolds in the spiritual and corporeal realms. It is this one word, be, that bestows being, so all things are implicitly contained within it. God directs this one word at everything to which he wants to give being. As the Quran puts it, God is speaking, our only word to a thing when we desire it is to say to it, be, and it comes to be. The things, our only word to a thing when we desire it, the things, these things, to whom God speaks, abide in what Ibn Arabi calls non-existence, which is to say that they are non-existent in themselves, though not unknown to God. In other terms, Non-existence is the realm of the divine omniscience. God knows all things and all entities, ayan, for all eternity. But they have no existence of their own before he tells them to come to be. At that point he utters them, and they come to be articulated within his breath. Their being belongs not to them, but to the divine breath within which they are pronounced. Ibn Arabi writes, nothing becomes manifest in the cosmos except from the attribute of speech. Thus, 
the All-Merciful turns his face towards one of the entities and then the individuality that he intends opens up within the breath. Now, given that creatures are nothing but words uttered by God, their knowledge of things, which also are words, can only come by way of God's speech. As Ibn Arabi puts it, quote, the existence of created being has no root other than the divine attribute of speech. For created being knows nothing of God but his speech, and that is what it hears. If creatures know nothing but speech, this is because there is nothing else to know. The speech that they know is the speech that says to them, be. It never ceases belonging exclusively to God. This is why Ibn Arabi can write that the true attribute of creation is silence. Just as the true attribute of God is speech. When speech is attributed to creation, it is done it is done so only inasmuch as God has bestowed it, just as when being is attributed to creation, it is done so only inasmuch as God has said be to it. Again, I quote Ibn Arabi. God says, there is nothing that does not glorify him in praise. Quote. We maintain that there is nothing whatsoever in existence that is silent. On the contrary, all things are speaking in laudation of God. In the same way, we maintain that there is nothing whatsoever in existence that speaks in respect of its own entity. On the contrary, every entity other than God is silent and without speech. Since all things are loci of manifestation for God's being, speech belongs to God, who is the manifest. In short, speech, God, in short, God speaks through all things. As speakers, the things are signs or verses that give voice to the names and attributes of God. They are words pronounced in the all-merciful breath. They appear in three books. The book of the universe, the book of the soul, and the book of Revelation, the book of Scripture. Now, in Islamic theology in general, the creatures are commonly called the acts of God. Ibn Arabi explains that these acts of God are nothing but, but the traces of God's names, the vestigia dei. Now, but what about the divine names themselves? What exactly are they? Ibn Arabi writes that when we speak of names, ism, whether we are talking about God or creatures, we are speaking about something that occurs from a trace or something from which a trace comes to be. So again, a name, like other words, is a cut or a wound in the unarticulated fabric of universal being. The ultimate source of all names and all realities is, of course, the very selfhood of God, called the essence. In himself, God knows everything that will appear in the universe for all eternity, because all things are simply the traces of his knowledge of his own essence which is infinite and absolute being. So God knows not only his own names, but also the names of all things. If he calls himself by many names, both in the Quran and in other scriptures, it is because the traces of the names are infinitely diverse. As Ibn Arabi puts it, God made the divine names many only because of the diversity of the traces that are manifest in created being. So from a certain standpoint, the divine names are the traces of all the divine attributes and qualities that become manifest in creation. God names himself in terms of the creatures, which are, after all, simply the words that he pronounces. Within the creatures, certain qualities can be discerned. And these can only be the qualities of their creator, the one who pronounces the words. 
The words express nothing but the self of the speaker. The divine speaker is revealing himself through his speech. As merciful, as alive, as knowing, as powerful, as speaking, and so on down the list of the so-called 99 names of God. All names, whether names of God or names of creatures, are in the last analysis traces of the divine essence, which is the absolute and infinite selfhood of the real. In itself, the essence is without trace and unknowable to any but itself. Nonetheless, man has been given the capacity to know all the names, all the traces displayed by the essence. Traces that are nothing but all things that can enter into existence. It is this potential omniscience that sets man apart from all other creatures. When the prophet said, repeating the Judeo-Christian scriptures, when the prophet said God created Adam in his own image or his own form, surah, he certainly had in mind the fact that God gave Adam knowledge of all things. The Quran is explicit on this point. The famous verse, he, God, taught Adam the names, all of them. Ibn Arabi points out that it is precisely names that make dhikr possible. This is true not only for man, but also for God. The Quran often attributes dhikr to God, as in the verse, Fazkuruni Azkurukum, remember me and I will remember you. God, after all, knows things through their names which are nothing but their essences or entities present eternally in his own omniscience. Ibn Arabi writes, Adam was preferred over the angels only because he encompassed the knowledge of the names. For were it not for the names, God would remember nothing, and nothing would remember God. So, God remembers only through the names, and he is remembered and praised only through the names. So, the distinguishing feature of man is knowledge of the names, which are the traces of the divine qualities, or the traces of the divine essence itself. In the creative act of the eternal now, God voices the names. And these names appear as the creatures within the all-merciful breath. The endless array of, cr of, create of creatures other than man are specific words of God. Every creature has a certain understanding of God, but only in respect of the specific name or the names that differentiate it from all other named things. Only man was taught all the names, making him somehow equivalent to all the creatures. In the universe as a whole, the names are infinitely differentiated. But in the divine image that is man, they are brought together in an all-comprehensive epitome. Adam received the all-inclusive knowledge of the names when God taught it to him. And he was able to know all the names precisely because he was made in the image of God, who knows and utters all things. Thus, in fact, Adam came to know and understand the names by knowing his own self, made in God's image. Now, this sort of knowledge, of course, does not come by, by the intermediacy of discursive thought, but rather directly from the nature of things. Thus, in the following passage, Ibn Ari refers to it by a standard Sufi expression for unmediated knowledge, tasting or sapience, in the etymological sense, Valk. He writes, God taught Adam all the names from Adam's own essence through tasting. For he disclosed himself to him in his entirety. No name remained in the divine presence that did not become manifest to Adam from himself. From his own essence, he came to know all the names of his creator. Q 
Quranic theology and cosmology, rooted in words, names, and remembrance, allows Muslim sages to understand the human role in the cosmos largely in terms of the achievement of true knowledge of God. This is a role that belongs exclusively to human beings because they alone were created in God's image and they alone were given the potential to know all the names. Ibn Arabi explains this human uniqueness in many passages. In one of these, he begins by referring to the, to the Quranic verse that describes the protest of the angels when God told them that he was going to create Adam as his vicegerent, his khalifa in the earth. I quote, the angels judged that Adam would bring about corruption because of what was manifest in his configuration. They saw that he would stand through the diverse, conflicting, and mutually averse natures. They knew that the traces of these roots must become manifest in him who possessed this configuration. However, if they had known Adam's non-manifest dimension, which is the reality of the image in which God created him, they would have seen themselves as a part of Adam's creation. The angels were ignorant of the divine names that Adam obtained when his all-comprehensiveness was unveiled to him. When Adam saw his own essence, he came to know his ground in all things and from all things. For the whole cosmos is the differentiation of Adam, and Adam is the all-comprehensive book. In relation to the cosmos, he is like the spirit in relation to the body. Thus, man is the spirit of the cosmos, and the cosmos is his body. Through both together, the cosmos is the macroanthropos, al insan al kabir so long as man is within it. But if you look at the cosmos alone, without man, you will find that it is like a body, proportioned and made ready, but without a spirit. The perfection of the cosmos through man is like the perfection of the body through the spirit. Although man was created as the perfection of the cosmos, or as the active spirit that governs its receptive body, this does not mean, of course, that any given individual lives up to the human role. Clearly, the whole point of the prophetic messages is to remind people of the perfection that is theirs by birthright. In order to possess it, however, they must set out to achieve it. And the only way to do so is to follow the prophetic guidance. If it already calls those who do achieve the fullness of human stature, perfect man, al insan al -kam. The historical examples of those who reach this status are provided by the prophets and some of the saints. And among women by Mary, the prophet specifically says that among women, Mary was perfect. However this may be, the fact remains that most people remain at the level of what Ibn Arabi calls animal man. He reserves the attribute perfect precisely for the greatest of all human beings. He tells us, for example, that in every other sort of creature in the universe, some are complete, tam, but none are perfect, tam. Nothing is perfect, save through this perfect human configuration. When man is not perfect, he is the animal human, named by the definition rational animal. Now, perfect human beings, according to Ibn Arabi, actualize God's goal in creating the universe. That goal is, is explained mythically in the famous hadith, I was, God is speaking, I was a hidden treasure, and I desired to be known, so I created the creatures that I might be known. Only human beings can know God in the fullness of his divinity, because only they were created in his total image. Indeed, this knowledge of God is already demanded by the Quranic verse that states God's purpose in creating man, that I already quoted. I created jinn and mankind only to worship me. 
as Ibn Abbas, a companion of the Prophet, already explained, to worship me, Ya'buduni, means to know me, Ya'arifuni. Especially significant here is the word know, which also means to recognize. The Arabic word implies that this knowledge is the recovery of a misplaced innate knowledge. In other words, we come to remember what we have forgotten. It is the same knowledge that is mentioned in the famous saying attributed to the Prophet, constantly quoted in Sufi texts, he who knows himself knows his Lord, or he who recognizes himself recognizes his Lord. In one of many possible interpretations, one can say that the saying means, he who recognizes himself and knows himself for the creature of God that he actually is, will recognize his Lord and know his Lord for the God that he actually is. The two verbal nouns derived from this verb, ma'rifa and irfan, are both often translated as gnosis. Both are used to designate unmediated knowledge of God. In one passage, Ibn Arabi explains the purpose of creation as worship and as recognition or gnosis. He points out that human beings are the means whereby this purpose is achieved. I quote, human beings are intended by the existence of the world by the second intention, not the first. As for the first intention, what was intended by the creation of the world was the worship of God. I mean, worship through recognition, erfan, of the perfection of existence that is achieved, uh, a recognition that is achieved by contingent things. In short, the only creature, the only contingent thing that can recognize God in the fullness of his reality and that can know him in all his names is man. In one of the passages in which he sums up the significance of human existence, Ibn Arabi explains this as follows. Since creation has many levels, and since the most perfect level is occupied by man, each kind within the cosmos is a part with regard to the perfection of man. Even animal man is a part of perfect man. So every knowledge of God belonging to a part of the cosmos is a partial cos knowledge, except in the case of man. For his knowledge of God is the whole cosmos' knowledge of God. His knowledge of God is a universal knowledge, though not a knowledge of the whole. Were a knowledge of the whole, he would not have been commanded to say, Rabbi Zidni Ilman, the chronic verse, my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Do you think that the knowledge man is commanded to seek is knowledge of other than God? No, by God. It is knowledge of God. So, God created perfect man in his image. And through the image, he gave him the ability to have all of his names ascribed to him, one by one, or in groups, though all the names together are not ascribed to him in a single word. Thereby, the Lord is distinguished from the perfect slave. Only God is called Allah. No human. Hence, there is none of the most beautiful names, and all of God's names are most beautiful, by which the perfect slave is not called, just as he calls his master by them. Now, in the diverse creatures of the cosmos, other than man, on whatever level they may dwell, from spiritual and angelic to corporeal and sensory, the traces of God's names and attributes are externalized as the specific and unique characteristics of each thing. Every creature in the universe knows God in a specific, differentiated, indeterminate way, defined by the attributes that the thing displays, or by the word that it embodies. Each thing displays the signs of God and gives news of him through occupying its own specific niche in the never-repeated speech that is the universe. In contrast, in the multi-leveled reality that is the human self, the traces of God's names and attributes are internalized and circle around the heart, which is the luminous center of the being, the spirit that God blew into Adam when he created him from clay. 
Man alone is given the potential to know God in a global synthetic manner. Because man alone is created in the image not of one or of several specific names, but in the image of the all comprehensive name Allah, which designates God as such in both his absoluteness and his infinity, in both his essence and his attributes, his incomparability and his similarity, his transcendence and his imminence. If the fullness of worship is to remember God and serve him in a manner appropriate to the totality of his reality, it is obvious that only man made in God's image can worship. Nonetheless, worship in a narrower sense it simply means serving God's purposes. And in this sense, everything serves God because a contingent being can do nothing but serve the absolute being from which it draws its total reality. As the Quran puts it, none is there in the heavens and the earth that comes not to the all-merciful as a servant. Each thing serves God in the specific mode of its being. Each creature has a determined status as a word within the breath of the all-merciful. However, man has no specific mode of being because he has no inner limits to his awareness and consciousness, for only he is a global image of the all-knowing and the all-aware. In effect, man has the potential to be the outward image of the all-merciful breath itself, the manifestation of all of being and of all the divine names and attributes. Man's distinctive status means that only he can fulfill the final purpose of creation which is for God to be worshipped and served, not simply in the passive way that all creatures worship him, but also in the active way achieved by full consciousness of the hidden treasure and the free acceptance of everything that it demands. This is why Ibn Arabi points out that man's function as vicegerent of God is the specific ontological role of fulfilling the creative process and achieving creation's purpose. So central is the human role that, if it were not fulfilled, the world would simply disintegrate. I quote, God made this earth a place for the vicegerency. Hence it is the abode of his kingdom and the site of his deputy, who becomes manifest through the properties of his names. So from the earth he created us. Within it, he gave us residence, both alive and dead. And from it, he will bring us forth through the uprising in the last configuration. Thus, worship never leaves us wherever we are in this world and the afterworld. For even though the afterworld is not an abode of religious prescription, it is an abode of worship among us. Whoever witnesses without cease that for which he was created in this world and the next is the perfect servant, the intended goal of the cosmos and the deputy of the whole cosmos were all the cosmos, the high of it and the low of it, to be heedless of God, to be heedless of God's remembrance for a single moment and were this servant to remember him in that remembrance, he would take the place of the whole cosmos, and through him existence would be preserved for the cosmos. However, if the human servant were to be heedless of remembrance, the cosmos could not take his place in that. That of it, which is empty of the man who remembers God, would go to ruin. The prophet said, the hour will not come as long as there remains in the earth one person who is saying, Allah, Allah. To review my main points, the worldview of Islam depicts God, the universe, man, and prophecy in terms of word and speech. The three principles of faith, unity, prophecy, the return, are all understood in terms of God's names and his naming. Man's task 
is to respond to his situation by remembering the names of things, that is, the real and actual names of things, which are the things inasmuch as they designate the divine reality, or inasmuch as they are articulations of the divine speech. This human task can only be accomplished in the heart, a word that designates the unlimited realm of human awareness and consciousness. The heart alone, among all created things, is given the capacity to encompass God. As the famous extra-Quranic divine saying puts it, one which Dr. Nass quoted last night, my heavens and my earth embrace me not, but the heart of my believing servant does embrace me. To remember God fully and actually is to find him sitting within the heart, which is his throne in the microcosm. Again, let me quote Ibn Arabi. God took this, the heart of his servant as a house. For he made it the locus of knowledge of him. The knowledge that is gnosis, erfan, not theory, nova. He defended the house with zeal and jealousy, lest it be a locus for others. The service is all comprehensive. Inescapably, the real becomes manifest to the servant in sundry forms, or in the form of everything. For the servant is the locus for the knowledge of all things. And there is no locus of knowledge but the heart. But the real, God is jealous of his servant's heart, lest anything other than his Lord reside within it. Therefore, he let the heart see that it is the form of everything and identical with everything. For the servant's heart embraces everything. The reason for this is that everything is real. Because nothing embraces things but the real. Whoever knows the real, in respect of his realness, has known everything. However, someone who knows a thing does not thereby know the real nor does he know it in reality. The, the servant who supposes that he knows a thing does not in fact know it. For if he did know it, he would know that it is the real. Thus, as long as he does not know that it is the real, we say concerning him that he does not know it. Now, knowledge of things as they actually are can only come by knowing them as disclosures of the real as signs and traces displaying God's names and attributes. This is not a theoretical sort of knowledge, but a knowledge of recognition and gnosis, of tasting. The unveiling of the face of God that is always present in the created realm. As the Quran reminds us, wherever you turn, there is the face of God. Such knowledge comes by way of dhikr, which is Al-Hudur al Presence with the one remembered. It is only this sort of knowledge that allows man to see that everything in this world is accursed if he does not see it as displaying the real and that he himself is accursed to the extent that he does not know that things do in fact display the real. Once we see the world for what it is, we see that it is nothing but remembrance of God and we can do nothing but remember him in the world and through the world. Everything is accursed, says the Hadith, except the remembrance of God. But everything is remembrance of God, so nothing is accursed. The alchemy of dhikr transmutes the accursed into the blessed. The place of that dhikr, where God becomes truly present and man becomes truly blessed, is the heart. Let me leave you with a bit of advice from Ibn Arabi. The greatest sin is what brings about the death of the heart. It dies only by not knowing God. This is what is named ignorance. For the heart is the house that God has chosen for himself in this human configuration. But such a person has misappropriated the house, coming between it and the owner. 
A person like that is the one who most wrongs himself because he has deprived himself of the good that would have come to him from the owner of the house had he left the house to him. This is the deprivation of ignorance.